Hey fellow Bible geeks, we've been diving into the Old Testament and exploring these cool little things called undesigned coincidences that serve as evidence for the trustworthiness of the Bible. Another kind of undesignedness that can crop up is when we look at instances where information is assumed by the author, but not explicitly spelled out. J.J. Blunt called this the uniformity of expressive silence, where repeated omissions seem to carry meaning. Today, I want to zoom in on a couple of these gems within the story of Isaac and Rebecca and Jesus and his adopted father, Joseph. Now, picture this scene from Genesis 24. Abraham's servant is out there on a mission to find a wife for Isaac. He stumbles upon Rebecca just going about her day carrying a water jar. And when the servant asks for a drink, Rebecca not only gives him water, but also takes care of his camels. Now, here's where it gets interesting. In the story, there is a whole lot left unsaid about Rebecca's father. It's like the author's subtle way of dropping hints without explicitly stating them. Let's dig into Genesis 24, 22 through 28 and unpack it a little bit. It reads, When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing 10 gold shekels and said, Please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, we have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness towards my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsman. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. Now, let's chat about Bethuel's part in the story. Normally, as Rebecca's dad, He'd be the one in charge of the marriage arrangements. But in Genesis 29, it's Laban, Rebecca's brother, who takes the lead when Laban's daughter ties the knot. What's interesting is that, just like Rebecca, Laban's daughters also had brothers. Now, let's compare this with Bethuel's role in Genesis chapter 24. When Abraham's servant asks, please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? There's a bit of an odd response. Unlike Rachel, who ran to her father's household in Genesis 29, 12, Rebecca heads straight to her mother's family. As noted in Genesis 24, 28, the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. This little detail may seem insignificant, but it matters. And in verse 29, we learn that Rebecca's brother Laban takes charge running out to meet the servants at the spring. After Laban invites the servant into the house and the servant explains his mission, we see Bethuel just briefly mentioned in verse 50, which reads, Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, dot, dot, dot. This little tidbit is the only hint we get that Bethuel was even there for the occasion. And hey, they're on board with the servant's plan, letting Rebecca marry Isaac just as God directed. Gifts are offered by Abraham's servant, yet noticeably they're designated to Rebecca and to her brother and her mother. You know what's really interesting? There's no mention whatsoever of gifts for Bethuel. In verse 55, Rebecca's brother and mother suggest that she remain with them for at least 10 days before departing. Traditionally, this proposal would come from the father, but here it's initiated by her mother and brother. After consulting with Rebecca, it's agreed that she will indeed leave with the servant. So check it out. Isaac, Abraham's son, ties the knot with Rebecca, and they end up having a kid named Jacob. After Jacob pulls off the sneaky move with his dad to steal his brother's blessing, Rebecca tells him to hit the road because Esau's out for revenge, ready to take him out. On his journey, Jacob bumps into some shepherds and asks, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? It's rather odd because Laban's actually Bethuel's son, not Nahor's. Nahor is his grandfather. It's like Bethuel is getting overlooked yet again in his own family. We don't really know why Bethuel seems to be taking a back seat within his own family. The writer of Genesis just doesn't spell it out. Maybe he was just getting on in years and wasn't all there upstairs. Or maybe he was just kind of the village idiot. But here's the kicker. Even though the Bible doesn't explicitly state certain things, there's this whole vibe like the author knew more than they let on. It's like they're dropping subtle hints without outright saying it. 
This kind of pattern feels more like what you would see in real life historical reportage and not in just a made up story. But wait, because there's more. When we look at the Gospels, we notice something similar with Joseph, Jesus's adoptive father. After Jesus's birth, as described in Matthew and Luke, Joseph seems to fade into the background. He's briefly mentioned in John 6, but the last time we see Joseph in action is when Jesus is taken to the temple at the age of 12. Joseph is strangely missing, even when Jesus' mother, brothers, and sisters are in the spotlight. Take, for instance, Mark 3, 31-35. It reads, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Just look at the text. Do you notice what's interesting here? He doesn't mention his father. He talks about his mother, brothers, and sisters. Or consider his rejection in Nazareth as described in Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. It reads, He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? Where is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? Notice Jesus' hometown crowd claims that he's not the son of Joseph, but he's referenced to being the son of Mary. Or check out John 2 through 12. It reads, After this, they went down to Capernaum, with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. So Jesus went to the wedding, not with his dad, but only his mother, brothers, and the twelve. Then, after the ascension, in Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, we also read, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James, all these were with one accord, devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Again, here's Jesus' disciples and his family, but Joseph is completely absent. You know what's really striking? When Jesus is on the cross, he doesn't turn to his father Joseph and say, hey, take care of my mother. Instead, he assigns her to the beloved disciple. It's like this consistent pattern of assuming certain things without explicitly stating them. Nowhere are we told in the Gospels what has happened to Joseph. There's this silent presumption of his death, but it's never spelled out in the text. This suggests that the Gospel authors knew more about the circumstances surrounding Joseph than they explicitly tell us in their accounts. Like we saw with Bethuel, This expressive silence surrounding Joseph's absence in the gospel narratives is a hallmark of a truthful account. I hope you've been enjoying this series on undesigned coincidences, and there are more examples to come in future videos. Be sure to hit subscribe, tap the bell for notifications, and stay tuned. Thanks for watching.